We're live for a mailbag show. You guys are in here in the chat, ready to get your questions locked, loaded, and ready to fire at us. Michael Bolton, he's here. He's up early. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the reason that Jan is not happy and I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. Uh, we're here, and we're going to answer your questions live. And I am joined for the first time this season on these mailbag shows. He's going to be here multiple times throughout the year, once a month. It is uh, the man from Elite Fantasy Basketball, Adam Stock, is here. Adam, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pumped to get the first one down and pumped to come back a few times more this year. I'm sure everyone is going to be go really, really easy on us and uh, ask very easy questions. Is it e- first question is really easy. It's more directed at me. Yellow Mamba says, did I hit on Kobe 6 reverse Grinch? They didn't even drop him here, I don't think. I didn't see him get released here, so no, I didn't. And even if they did, I wouldn't have got him. But we'll see. We'll see what happens if they actually do release them. All right. Um, Trade question. Trade questions could be hard to a- answer, Adam, but I'm going to throw this one out there because I think it's relatively easy. Would you trade Franz Wagner and Asar Thompson to receive Chet Holmgren? This is, a, I think, pretty easy just in terms of the specific players, but also just a general trade um, mechanations idea. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If let, Chet will probably slow down a teeny bit, but he's probably going to be at least a top 20 guy. And if you're going to top 20 guy for uh, Wagner, mid-round guy, Start slowing down a bit, like that—that's that, a no-brainer. You, you get the elite guy, and then you find a guy who might be similar to uh, Sar on the wire later in the year. Like, it, it's the end of November; you got lots of time to fill that spot. Yeah, and the other thing is, like, even if you can't find someone exactly the same as a Sar on the wire, and you probably can't, right? But the ability to find someone who does something that's quite good for two weeks due to, due to an injury, and then you move on from that guy and grab the next guy, or you stream that spot and get five or six games from the week, that's the benefit of that waiver wire spot. It's not just about, well, the only guy on my waiver wire is Contavious Caldwell Pope, and that's not that good. It's about using that spot to take the next guy who steps up, like to take the next, you know, Santi Aldama for his little run, or to take, um, you know, I can't even think, some backup center who comes in and starts for two weeks. Duncan. Robinson or some guy like that. Yeah. Joga Badadze, like these sort of guys who yeah. step up into these roles for this short period of time and you just don't turn down a, an option to get someone like a Chet Holmgren in that scenario. Now, if you're in like a 20-team league, that extra depth of those two guys who are probably top 100 players has more weight. Like that's got more value and that's a different situation. But in a 12-teamer, yeah, and, and, if, and the shallower you go, the more you want to lean to that number one, that number one to, sort, of, uh, sort of option. Um, all right, this is the trending stuff at the moment, Adam. So, GNO, Gino, maybe any projections on Boyan Bogdanovich's role and his minutes coming back? This is a question that is getting uh, asked a lot. We haven't seen Boyan this season at all. He is set to return. This Pistons team stinks. What do you think his role is going to be? I, I don't. Re- they need him. Obviously, it's a sad state of affairs when you rely upon a 34 year old to be the key piece of what you need to do. But they need what he does. I would think that at some point common sense would prevail and they would just bench Isaiah Stewart because he's not a starting power forwards asshole. Like he's not there, right? He shouldn't be there. But I don't know that that happens straight away. How do you view it? Yeah, the Pistons are a little unpredictable. Like, look, they're playing Ivy for what, like low 20s for a little bit. Now they're starting yeah. them, but they're, they're a tough team to predict. And and they seem to be pretty committed to Stu. So I'm not sure that mm. uh, Bogdanovich is going to be at 30 right out of the gate. They might ease him in a little bit. Uh, probably end up 28 to 30. Uh, we'll see if he starts starts or not. I, I think regardless of whether or not he starts, he's going to en- end up in that range. I would grab him, but uh, probably just a, a low end guy. Points threes, the free throw percentage impact is valuable, but overall, he's never been like a high upside guy. 
He had a really good season last season, obviously, but there were circumstances surrounding that. Like Cade Cunningham and his 36 usage was out all season, so Boyan had to become the number one guy. I think a, a good way to look at Boyan is look at maybe a little bit what he did in his jazz days, but then also realize he's two years older coming off an injury on a team that's not actually a playoff contender. So you maybe even drop that bat down a bit. So I, I do think he's worth grabbing. It could be either Stewart or they could bench Thompson because, again, they're idiots. Or it could be uh, Jaden yep. Ivey that moves to the bench. Like We don't know what happens in that scenario. It's worth grabbing him, but it is also worth understanding that this guy is not going to fix the Pistons. He's not going to fix your fantasy team either. He's going to be solid enough. But there are there is a risk that he turns into a a guy that's just points and threes with some free throw percentage, but the free throw percentage volume is lower than last season because he's just not tasked with doing as much as what he did last season. And that's, again, look at the the Utah numbers and maybe just dial back a little bit on that versus what he did last season in Detroit. I think that's probably a, a decent way of looking at that. Um, yeah, I, I think I think his impact could be less about his numbers and more about maybe it it gets K going a little bit, helps Duran a bit, a little bit, just kind of opening the floor for everybody. Maybe maybe a star too. Although he's starting to score fairly efficiently lately, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, was well, he shooting more than twelve percent from three? That would be a, an uptick for a star. So yeah. we'll see how how that looks. But the other thing with that, not to harp on on this too much, but. If you yeah. look at Cade's numbers and shooting, they look bad. If you watch the games, you go, oh, no, like he's got no hope. Like there's no way. How do these shots go? He's not blameless, but they don't respect anybody else on that team at all. So it's just everyone just pushes onto him and everyone, no one no one runs out to guard Stu. They all just sit in on Cade and it makes it really difficult. So it could open things up um, quite a bit, I think, there. Um, let's have a look at this one. Uh, is Josh Giddy ever going to be a drop? Where are you at with this one, Adam? I think he's dropping 10, and I, I don't mind him in, in 12, and it really has nothing to do with the off-court stuff. Like, you look at his numbers right now, he's, what, 12 points per game, 4.5 assists. You're really holding him for the, the six boards, and how much do you really care about getting six boards from your point guard instead of four, you know? Because you're taking all the hits everywhere else. So is it really worth it? Maybe if he was doing 12 and seven, like, assists, maybe I'd be a little more interested, but the dimes are down. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, they're, too, they're too committed to him. He's probably the guy that's going out if they ever cash in those those picks. They like Wallace. I, I, in in ten, definitely drop twelve. I'm fine with it. I, I wouldn't say a must drop, but if something nice like if Trey Murphy was out there, something to want to roll the dice, I'd be good with that switch. Yeah, look, I think I'm basically in the same spot. Like in a shallow league, you can move on, and it honestly has nothing to do with any pending suspension. The NBA is not going to suspend him unless something actually happens and there's a charge or something. Like that. The, the, their history. Just the people just seem to have this idea that the NBA just they just always sit guys down while investigations are on. Like we literally have something happening literally right now where Miles Bridges has an actual court date that happened and then got pushed back and has a date set in February. He's out there playing thirty seven minutes a night. The NBA is not suspending him waiting for the outcome of that. It, they don't do that. That's just not what they do. So I don't see that being the issue. The issue is the play. And you're right. He gets benched in fourth quarters all the time and he's not playing thirty minutes a night. And while there is improvement in what he's doing now, um. I'm not sure it's enough. I'm not sure it's enough to matter. Um, I don't. In just to push back on what you said about him maybe being the one that gets dealt, I think the guy they actually look at is also Lou Dort there because what the hell is he doing on that team? Like I don't know what he actually provides, but that that could be one of those two guys. You're right. Like it, the value there is not particularly uh, high for Giddy, and yeah, I think you can decide to move on in uh, in a lot of different scenarios. Vince says, is David Roddy going to stick as the starter three for Memphis? The easy answer there, Vince, is no, because they're changing things up every single game. Or actually, the, the easy answer is, um, I doubt it. Like, is David Roddy good? No. Is Santiel Dharma good? No. Is Zaya Williams good? No. None of them are. They'll have good games, and they'll have stinker games. Just go look at Roddy's game log, and you'll see how up and down it is. This is his second shot at being the starter, by the way. He's already had a go at that, and then he was bad, and they dropped him back down. I would not commit anything to grabbing Roddy outside of, hey, I've got an open roster spot. Let's stream him for a day, and let's see what happens. I have very little faith in that working. Yeah, definitely. They're, the entire year, they've just been throwing shit at the wall and hoping something sticks, and nothing ha has been. Uh, he's also not much of a permanent player, so I, I really don't see the appeal outside of super, super deep leagues where you're just picking up guys who play decent amounts. Exactly. He's not uh, He's not really a good fantasy player at all at this point. Uh, he's not a good real-life player, but these guys can have big games, and then they drop off, and consistency is usually part of the problem when we add it up over the course of four or five games. You go one game and four bad ones, and go, is that actually worth it? How do I pick the good one? The answer is that you can't. Today's episode, 
is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. As the weather gets colder, you know what? I've jinxed myself because I read this ad and I was laughing at all you guys in America heading into winter and snow and all this stuff. I go, ha, it's summer here. It's been cold and raining every single day. Then my uh, balcony collapsed and smashed my car due to the weather and the wind. So yeah, I guess FanDuel got me back for that one, but it doesn't matter because the offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's never been a better time to get in on the action spreads, player props, over-unders, futures, um, sides, totals, everything. It's all there. So, uh, parlays, you can do everything over on FanDuel. In fact, you can even check out the odds for the in-season tournament, which will wrap up in approximately eight days' time. Nine days' time? Nine days' time over in Las Vegas. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get into the NBA season. FanDuel is also an official partner of the NFL, and don't forget to gamble responsibly. This question from uh, the depressed penis himself, Sadiq Bay, says, should I sell high on DF3 Melton since Ubre is coming back? And there's a lot of things to unpack there. I'll let you have first crack at it, Adam. Can you sell high on Melton? I, I just that's, feel that's, like that's he has so, such unpack. a little name value and everyone's a little spooked by the slow start. You probably can't do it. I, I have a hard time believing anyone's going to give you like, a top 75 guy for him. So I probably just hold tight and see where where it goes. It, it's not like their new guys have really popped. Like platoon has been okay. Covington's not playing too, too much. I, I think they will probably just slide in Ubre for Batum, who's already playing like 26 ish. So let's say Ubre gets 20 to 30. I don't think Melton's going to take too much of a hit. Like he'll slow down because he's been hot from the field, but uh, I, I would ride it out. It's one of these classic things I think with Melton is you're right. Like, Hey, no one's going to give you anything to sell high on Melton. So like in theory, sure, but it's just, that's not going to happen. Um, but with the the situation here is that Melton was really shooting poorly, and that had nothing to do with Ubre being in the lineup. Ubre got hurt, and Melton's shooting improved, and he looks better. And people go, "Well, it's obviously because Ubre's not there." And I don't think it is. I don't think it's a usage thing necessarily. I don't. It's just that the shots started going in, which is the patience that most of us were preaching regarding DeAnthony Melton. So just wait on this. Like he's not going to be a thirty percent shooter. And what could happen here is he could go into a downturn when Ubre returns. We go, see, I knew it. Ubre was back and Melton fell way off when really it's just stuff that has actually no relevance at all. If he starts losing minutes and starts losing significant usage, then you go, okay, maybe it is an Ubre thing. But I, I don't even know that 100% that Ubre starts, to be fair, because their second unit doesn't have any shock creation whatsoever. Nick Nurse was very um, cautious before Ubre's injury to say that, yeah, Kelly will be in the starting lineup for now and when those players arrive, and he might just keep Batum in there, play him 24 minutes, and Ubre gets 30 off the bench, which might be good or bad. I don't know. So sell high. You're not going to be able to do it. Um, and is Ubre going to impact him? We're in alignment there, Adam, and thinking probably not, like maybe, but not enough to make that big of a, uh, of a difference, I don't think. Che Jordan, how do you know who is a top 50 or a top 80 player? I'm a first-time player. Well, you're a first-time player. Welcome to playing fantasy basketball. How can you tell these things? Well, there are plenty of different resources for that. Be really cautious about how you intake uh, rankings as well. But we have them at Basketball Monster. Each site you have on will have a rankings list. But also, it is, it is very careful. You need to be very careful in how you interpret the numbers that are presented to you. Um, I think there is risks in looking at, especially with small samples that's happened five weeks in, if you look at just the production that's happened, you can't always extrapolate that out. If you look at things like total value from things that have happened already, that will skew versus a guy that's missed five games and someone hasn't, it'll throw things off. So it can be a little bit tricky. How do you approach that idea, Adam, of like, you know, when people, because I'll say this, they trade this guy in top 80 player, and how do you approach that valuation of a guy yeah it's tricky because i think when you're talking top 50 or top 80 you can't just actually look at their numbers like maybe some guys mm. top 45 but then he is very injury prone or maybe all his value is in in one category i don't think you can just blindly look at the rankings and be like okay this guy's top 45 so he's a top 45 player i think you have to take a more holistic approach like look at all, all the factors. I, I know it's easy to say like this guy has been top 50 over the last two weeks and, and stuff like that. That gives you an idea of how he's playing. But for his value, especially when you're looking at trades and stuff, I think you have to bring in more factors than just the current per game numbers, especially at this time of the year, because you can have two or three first round lines and that can carry a guy, especially someone who's not necessarily a top, a top 50 guy that can boost the guy's ranking for the next month. Exactly. It, it can. It can. And it really impacts um, things like someone, you know, had a go at me for talking about how Dennis Schroeder's recent numbers have fallen off. He goes, no, they haven't. What are you talking about? He just had one bad game. Well, the man started off as a top 30 player, I think, for the first two weeks. 
and yeah. now he's like about 80th, but like 120th over the last week. And that's rapid changes that can happen really quickly when we're talking 15 game sample sizes here. So it's a little bit of what has happened. It's a little bit what you expect to happen moving forward, understanding the small sample variance of certain stats. And that's why when I try to look at rankings, I have weights on things to try and eliminate some of that variance. It is a tough thing to do. Chris, the best way that, that I would suggest to you, and Adam probably has a similar idea, is like we have our projections on our side. He has his uh, on his side is that we have these projections moving forward. And that's what I would look at. If this guy is projected to be a top 80 guy rest of the season moving forward, then that's how I would like to view someone as a top 80 player. That's how I like to do it because I put a lot of bloody work into trying to work out where these guys all fit moving forward. Obviously, there's going to be variance, but that sort of takes it away versus, well, this is what has happened up until this date, and that's all that's going to happen moving forward because there's uh, so much variance in all that stuff, again, especially with just five weeks uh, into the NBA season. Michael asks a question here that is very specific to me. Is the C word the worst in Australia? No. No, it's not. Like, I guess for some people, but mate, I... Every every show that I do, mate, I have to be really careful that I'm not just dropping that in um, because it, it does it does happen <laughs> relatively. Uh, it's a relatively common occurrence here. So yeah, often if I say mm, I almost said a really rude, rude word, that is what I almost said. So there you go. Um, okay, I don't think this really matters too much about the size of the league from Rim Shaker, 16-team league. He says, what about Devin Vassell versus Jonas Valanciunas? Now, this would have been a no-brainer, Adam, at the start of the season that we would have taken Vassell. But the Pals have changed their ideas here. Part of it, I think, is that Larry Nance might be actually just fully washed. I, I think he's cooked. And what they would do in the past is they'd play Valanciunas 21 minutes. Nance would play the entire fourth quarter, play next to Zion, and they'd limit Valanciunas and Zion playing together. I don't think Nance can do it anymore. So they're playing Valanciunas 27, 28 minutes a night. This gets a lot closer now. How do you view these two? that's really tough. I'd still take Vassell as the per game guy, just because I don't think Val is going to continue to block as many shots. Like he's always been a really good per minute guy and he can totally be really good in 26, 27, but the block rate is way up. The thing with, with Vassell is just, I think the Spurs are always going to baby him throughout the year. And just last year still has me a little spooked where they had guys in and out of the lineup all March. Like, yeah, they weren't like really shut down, mm. but they were playing every third game. So for me, I think at this point, that's tough because I really like Vassell as a player, but at this point, I, I would call that a cat need uh, uh, one. I, I think both guys are a little risky uh, for for different reasons, but I, I believe uh, I'm buying Val enough to say that's a close one. Yeah, I just made an adjustment on Valanciunas' rest of season projections about 10 minutes before we went to air here because I'd had him at like 25 minutes and they've changed their, they've changed their approach and he's playing a lot more than that. So I bumped him up a couple of minutes there. So I do think that... It's relatively close. It is a cat need thing, but I feel more secure in Valanciunas not having these weird injuries or these weird, you've got to play 27 minutes coming off the bench as you return from injury multiple times the way that Vassell has already and that happened last season as well, which will dick around his numbers. Whereas Valanciunas in 27 minutes and I'd actually sits in that level. If you ever played 31, then he'd jump way ahead, but that's that's unlikely. So there's a little bit more safety, I think, there in um, in Valanciunas at this point, which is a, a weird thing to... um. Uh, a weird thing to uh, a, a, or consider consider where they were at the beginning of the season. Um, all right, here's one question for you, Adam. Who has significantly outperformed their ADP that has surprised you the most? That's good. I guess we talked about him before, but Schroeder was pretty surprising too. Mm. He, he's been a it's been really a nothing guy, like a streamer guy his entire career. I and mean, I guess it's just a good fit, basically with with the Raps. Darko loves him playing 32. Trent is having a god awful year, so. So that has helped. Uh, he's one of them um, mm, outperformed. I, I guess I, with the league guys. I'll tell you yeah, what, I'll tell you one I think that is it's, it's very specific, but again, this is something I just worked on before we went live, is what Kyle Kuzma's done this season. Right, We thought that he'd have an increase in usage, but he'd have a lack of defensive stats and he'd have these real percentage issues. The man's shooting 83% from the line and now he's dishing assists like he's LeBron. Like, I don't know where that came from. Like, I've never seen that before in his game. And that is going to make him a guy that was going, getting drafted around the 70s, which was already a way too low ADP for points leagues. Like he should have been a top 40 points league guy. And I harped on about that. But for categories, I thought it was about okay, but you had to have some certain tolerances for bad stuff. But he's crushing it. And he's in a completely different role. I had no, no idea that he could be that player. I didn't think that he'd fix his free throws. But so far... Both of those things have happened. So he's been a gigantic surprise, uh, more so on the category side than points leagues. Yeah, I think that's really going. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, people haven't really noticed, I think, just because of the pool situation over there. Everyone's mm. just blaming pool. And then some of the other guys are doing decent stuff, like Kuzma. Denny's having a decent year, even though he's slowing down a little bit. It's not all bad in Washington. Gafford's turned it around, too. So Yeah. Yeah, Gaff, well, yeah Gafford's one of those guys that I cop so much shit about in the preseason, but... Well, not yeah, start of the, in the start of the season, like, oh, he's trash. What are you doing? You got to drop him. He's just doing, I think, exactly what I expected. I, he's like seventy percent, almost two blocks, decent enough mm-hmm. rebounds. Like he's just, he's never, he's never going to be good. He's never going to be a great player. But he's yeah. sort of doing, um, he's sort of doing what you what you wanted him to do. All right, today's episode is also brought to you by the Game Time app. When you are buying tickets to your next big event, you shouldn't have to worry about the process of getting the tickets. It should be really easy. That's what Game Time does. It's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last minute deals, all in prices, and views from your seat and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. If you want to grab a ticket to somewhere, to a, an event that's happening in your area, so it's today, right? You can go in there, you can look at the event, and you can just choose an area to sit. It's called their zone deals. You choose that area. I want to sit here. And they pick a specific seat for you. You don't have to choose the exact seat. And you can save up to 18% on those deals just by letting them choose that specific seat in the area that you want to sit. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create the account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Okay. Kevin Q, how likely is it for DeMar DeRozan to be traded? And if so, how much will this affect him to see if it's best to trade him? Now, this is, again, a question, Kevin, that I think is not specific here to DeMar DeRozan. It's specific to any of these sort of questions. There are a couple of things I think we need to, and I haven't had this, it's not even a rant, it's a PSA yet this season, Adam. People will be like, oh, December 15th is coming up, trades are going to happen. They aren't. That's not how the NBA works. You might get one of them happen before February. They just really don't execute many of these trades. I know December 15th, people will talk about that's when the league becomes eligible. They just don't do it. You might, again, you think you had one trade last season before the deadline, and that was the Rui Hachimura deal, maybe? I know, obviously, we've had James Harden, but that's a completely different story. But we, we had Rui Hachimura. I think every year you have one that happens around January. And the other thing we do is, so we look at all these things and we try and predict who's going to be traded, um, how that's going to impact their fantasy value. There's too many variables in here that I think to, to care about. Will DeRozan be traded? Like there's one variable. Where would he go? Another variable. Who would come back in a deal? Another variable. What team would he go to where they make other moves? Another variable. It's just too many things, too many decision tree type things for you to be there sitting there. Well, he could go, maybe the best return comes from a bad team that lets DeRozan have 30% usage and run the offense and put up big assist numbers and it boosts his numbers. Maybe he goes to a team where they don't need him in a starting lineup and he plays 28 off the bench as just a, uh, a scoring closer type of player. There's too many, deci- or the Bulls can't find someone and they keep him because they're inept as well. There's too many different variables even if it's not DeMar, it's somebody else. Like trying to, we, we can barely plan out the minutes someone's going to get game by game, let alone all of these different variables to make these things. And in the end, you, you're flipping a coin and who knows how it's going to turn out. Yeah, definitely. Like, first of all, the Levine thing has, has to happen and we don't know when that exactly will, will happen. Like, yeah, he's kind of killing the vibes there and whatnot, but Chicago's really in no rush. This is a write-off season. So I don't think they're going to rush into a deal where they don't get good value and yeah I, I could see them holding on to DeRozan look like they gave Vooch an extension just so to to make him easier to, probably I, I don't know what the Bulls it's always hard to say but probably to make him easier to trade maybe yeah, DeRozan what, hasn't signed his extension yet so that's another so well, variable man. you got to throw in it might be tough to trade him without an, an extension or to get at least get a, a, a decent package backs so I think if DeRozan is moved that's probably a trade deadline thing so you're still looking at like two, two and a half months away from him possibly uh, being moved. Uh, so for now, I wouldn't worry too, too much about that. The other thing with DeRozan is, is that he's not playing well. So if you're trading him away now, like, do you think he's going to be worse than he is now? Because he's not a top 50 guy at yeah. the moment. And I'm not sure how quickly he gets back there. So I, I would rather just ride that out in a lot of cases. I knew we were going to get one of these questions, Adam, and we've got it right now. Spencer says, do the losing teams in the quarterfinals of the in-season tournament play only one game next week? And I have said this multiple times, but I don't expect everybody to consume all of my content wherever I put it at all points, Spencer. So that's not at you, but I'm going to say it again. And people have heard this before. Every single NBA team plays two games next week. No exceptions. Every single team plays two games. The teams that play on the Monday, Tuesday quarterfinals, 
The ones that lose will then play on Friday. So at the moment, there are 11 games scheduled on Friday. There will be 13 games on Friday. The, the, the two or the four losers from the quarterfinals on Monday and Tuesday will slot their second game for the week onto Friday. So we're going to have two games Monday, two games Tuesday, 11 games Wednesday, two games Thursday, 13 games Friday, and then no fantasy games on Saturday and Sunday. Every single team has two games. Do not worry about looking at your schedule and seeing that the Pacers, the Celtics, the Knicks only have one game for the week. They don't. They have to. Trust me. Believe me. Don't worry about a source. I am your source. This is what is going to happen. How many times you got that question, Adam? Oh, probably 30, 40. Yeah, there's not much to it. Like stream the Monday, Tuesday guys and cheer for for the, your guys' teams to win. So you get yes. the game on Friday night. That's the big thing. So what are you, what are you doing? Like, in t- what are you doing? You're sitting here talking to me. What are you doing in terms of the planning for next week? Because that, that, that's the way that you do it. Like I actually just in industry pickup league today went and added Josh Hart. Not that I think Josh Hart's particularly good, but they've got a Thursday, Friday back-to-back this week. And then they play at least one game on those low volume days next next week as well. So one of the, attacking one of those guys from the eight teams that play you don't know that they're going to win and get the extra one on Thursday, but at least get one game from them because it is going to be like you, whoever you add on a Wednesday or Friday, you're probably not going to be able to stream in. There's nothing to do on the weekend. Prioritizing a a stream from one of the eight quarterfinal teams is probably your best weekly strategy for next week. Yeah, you got it. I've got guys on my team like Daniels and Radish who I'd oh, like yeah. to drop. They're my 13th man. I'd, like, I'd rather stream their spot, but with the early week game, you got to do it. But, and, and if you don't have a streaming spot, like you really got to think about it because next week is such low volume that an extra two or three games is going to make a huge difference. Like think back to the old all-star uh, week, uh, weeks before they combined the weeks. Remember those short Monday to Thursdays and it was super fluky. That's what next week's going to be like. So you really got to find a way just to squeeze out an extra two or three games. What this really, what this week really shows is something that I talk about quite a bit when I do my weekly preview shows is that it's not just about the number of games because every single team plays the same amount of games. There's no difference here. Everyone plays two. It's about when they play them in terms of how we're valuing these guys. So it's great that everyone plays two games. You don't have a games play disadvantage for your top end of your roster. So my Jokic will play two and Halliburton will play two and Shea will play two and Embiid will play two, injuries notwithstanding. So every all those guys play two. You're never at a disadvantage there. It's the back end of the roster that's important. A two-game week from the... Um, from the magic is not as important as a two game week from the Pacers or the Pelicans or the Kings or the or the Knicks or the Bucks or whatever because we can actually use those those guys. So yeah, Malik Beasley's and Josh Hart's and Al Horford's and Sam Houses and Dyson Daniels that you mentioned, Jordan Hawkins, like even if Trey Murphy comes back, just getting one to two games out of these guys where you can actually use them is and if they score six points, it's six points that you didn't have. And that you can't make up on Wednesday or Friday, like that's so that that is really key here, and that's why I really do like the Knicks. If you've got time now, like because they play Thursday, Friday this week, and then we can't really stream Saturday with twelve games. There's nothing on Sunday, and then they play again to begin next week on the lower volume days as well, and they might get another one on Thursday. So there's a little bit of extra value in those, you know, Quickly's and Hearts, and to a lesser extent Grimes and Divincenzo or Hartenstein. So there's, they're not great options, but when you're getting you know two extra games versus zero, that, that becomes important. I think that's, that's, that's enough on that. Um, all right, Triple B. Who is the odd man out with the Pelicans at full strength? This brings us all the way back around. The two big trending stories at the moment in fantasy, I think, Adam, are the return of Boyan and the return of Trey Murphy. We've talked Boyan already. Trey Murphy's coming back. So who's the odd man out? What do you think they do? Now, they're not obviously fully healthy now because Trey's not back to his normal self. Do you think Trey starts or do you think that they bring Herb Jones off the bench? Because honestly, that's really the only decision they've got to make. I think it's going to depend on how the season plays out. Herb's definitely going to start for a bit. And I think uh, Daniels and Hawkins, the young guys, are going to be probably be taking the biggest hits. Trey Murphy's really good. So mm. the minutes are going to be there. He'll be probably at least 28 plus. Will he, will he get the 31 like last year? I, I, I don't know. Well, I, I don't really have a strong opinion on what happens with Herb versus Murphy, but I'm pretty sure the other, other two guys are going to take a hit. But you, you, you want Murphy either way because Ingram and Zahn are going to miss lots of games. But they're not going to miss as many as last year, probably. But Murphy's still going to have some of those nights where he's playing 36 minutes and his upside is just gigantic. Yeah, we saw that last season. Now, you can look at Trey Murphy's overall numbers from last season, but they are skewed by, I think, the final two months or six weeks of the season, he played 37 minutes a night, right? And he was yeah. cooking at like 24 points a game with everybody out, right? He was putting, or with Zion out as mainly, but like he was cooking, putting up these huge numbers down the stretch with that. Uh, and uh, you see Joe dealing with a thumb issue as well. But earlier in the season, he wasn't 
playing that many minutes. The thing also with Herb is that even now, like they don't push Herb to 36 or 37 a night. Herb plays 30 a night. He gets into foul trouble yep. a lot. So even if Herb starts, he's not necessarily going to be the Zion Ingram minutes load player. So he can stay at 30. It's the guys, you're right, Hawkins, like does your know, Najee Marshall, these guys are getting 20 minutes a night. Dyson Daniels get 15 minutes a night. Jose Alvarado is 18 minutes a night. They're the guys who all lose out. So Trey won't be as good as he was last season. I feel really confident in saying that, but he's still a really good player. Yeah. And yeah, there might be people who make an argument that he's probably more important to this team than maybe even a Brandon Ingram in terms of complementary skills and X design. I don't know. Maybe someone might make that argument. We'll see how he goes. He was awesome last season, and it's just shit that he had such a slow start to the season. But grab him. We just got to temper our expectations. It's going to be a slow return and then trying to fit it all in. But I do think... It doesn't matter that much whether he starts or not, whether it's Herb, because Herb is not a gigantic minute starter anyway. He can play like a 29, 30 minute a night role starting and, and Murphy can get his 30, 31 coming off the bench. So you'd, uh, yeah, good answer. Um, all right, we'll do one more question. Let's see what we're going to do. Uh, the final one. Got to get a good one. Um, <laughs> that's not a good one. It was funny, but I'm not going to answer it. Um, all right. I want to do something that's specific to someone's team, though. So let's just find something that's more overall. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Do I believe that... Well, let's stay on the Pelicans. Do you believe that Zion will play in any back-to-backs this year? Adam Stock, what is your answer? We're putting it on the record. I'll say yes for a little bit, and then he'll pick up an injury, and they'll go back to not playing him. That's kind of how I feel with the Kawhi situation, too. Like, yeah, he's playing it for now, but what happens when he gets dinged up later in the year? I bet they'd be a little more cautious. I... And that, that's that's one of the interesting things about back-to-backs. I disagree with you on Zion. I think they've got a management plan in here to try and keep him healthy. I think they'll keep him out of back-to-backs all season if if that is possible. I, I Especially when they're playing well now, Trey's back. I think they'll keep him out all season. But the Kawhi thing is, because that was one of the questions. Someone said, hey, is Kawhi now an Iron Man? Like, yeah, sure. That's, he's an Iron Man. But that's the thing. Is that, like We can talk about guys sitting back-to-backs but and, and resting, and people love to harp on about it. But the, nearly the majority of the time that people sit on back-to-backs is A, because they've got a chronic issue or because they're coming back from an injury. So people talk about the Clippers last season and Paul George sits all the back-to-backs. Yeah, he sat like three back-to-backs because he had a hamstring injury and that was his return from them. And then he re-injured it and he returned and sat him out and then played every other one. So while we can look at this and Kawhi is healthy now, if he does get injured, when he comes back, he'll probably miss one or two back-to-backs as he returns from injury. And then he might go back and play them again. And every time you have a setback, you've got to rest your body as it recovers. So yeah, I, I agree with that. It's not as look, the only one to me that is absolutely set in stone for the season is Al Horford. He's not playing back to back, so that's just not going to happen. No need, yeah. Chris Middleton's probably the next one that's closest to that, as him not playing any back to backs. I think that's probably close that he might not do it. And to me, Zion's the one after that. But it all just depends on what happens in season. Like, it can happen to anybody who gets hurt and they come back. Uh, yeah, Jimmy Butler, like at the moment, he's dealing with injury, so he's not playing in the back to backs, but he might play them later on. It's all depending on actually how their body is recovering, because there have been studies out there that the back to backs increase the risk of injury like 20%. And it's more important for you know, wing and guard size players that increases that risk and the older you get it increases that risk too and teams just don't want to put their players through that level of risk um, yeah, for something that might cost them three or four weeks when they could sit out the, the one game for these guys who have these current injuries so I think that's an important point and that is going to be the important point that we ended on here Adam tell us what you've got uh, cracking over at uh, Elite Fantasy Basketball what happens over on your Twitter feed all that sort of stuff yeah, yeah, we're 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 in the mi- the middle of the regular season coverage. It's basically everyday coverage. I'm updating the projections every day, just kind of grinding it out. I try to do a big tweet about the games. I do box score analysis every day, and then I try to bring one to Twitter on the weekend, uh, just keep everyone up to date. But yeah, if you like daily coverage, we've got plenty. Go and check out Adam's stuff. Go follow him on Twitter, and of course. Uh... Yeah, we're going to be here doing shows all the time as well. Adam, thanks for jumping on. We'll see you in a month's time for another mailbag, uh, mailbag episode. You can uh, you can boot off while I close out the show. Thanks, mate. Perfect. Thanks, Josh. Guys, follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you are here on YouTube, I think you know what to do. You thumb it up and you leave your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.